come into the diagnosis of measles, uh, like I said earlier, all of these viral fevers have their own characteristic appearance, the way they come and the way they go. So it's mainly clinical. Uh, but then in case of an outbreak or in case of a sporadic measles uh, case, we definitely need to have a laboratory confirmation for uh, in order to um, uh, uh, you know, to record the disease or to, so we need to have a proper diagnosis. So that is why whenever, uh, in a, especially in a place where we have a endemic or an epidemic happening of measles, then such a place we definitely, whenever the patient comes to us with uh, these symptoms at the first point of contact itself, we have to collect three samples. That is the serum sample, throat or nasopharyngeal sample, and the urine sample. It is always good for us to collect these samples because uh, uh, because these samples can help us in diagnosing or uh, identifying measles. So what are the tests that are done? One is the serum uh, anti-measles antibody. Uh, so IgM, that is the most common test that is done. This is a blood test. And this usually is detectable after three, three days of the appearance of the rash. Uh, the other thing is the measles RNA. This can be done by RT-PCR. So this is usually done in a respiratory specimen. We can do it in the urinary specimen as well. Uh, there is also sometimes significant increase in the IgG titers that we see, so between the acute and the convalescent phases. Uh, we can also isolate the measles virus in the urine culture, but this is not very commonly done. It's usually done only for research purposes. But what is important for us in our day-to-day -day clinical usage is the uh, anti-measles uh, IgM antibody. So that is something that can easily be done just by taking a blood sample or also do an RT-PCR by taking a nasopharyngeal or a throat sample. If we do a blood test in these children uh, with who have measles, then we can have low platelet counts, we can have low WBC counts and low T-cell counts as well. If the child is having any pulmonary complications, then when we do a chest X-ray, we can see a interstitial pneumonitis, which can also be one of the findings. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, there are multiple diseases that can resemble measles, which is why it's important for for us to uh, differentiate or to diagnose it properly. So a lot of viral fevers can have rash associated with it, right? So uh, similar to measles, one is the rubella, uh, rubella infection as well. But here what happens is the rash is usually milder and the disease also is much milder. Uh, so rubella usually is a self-limiting infection. Only when rubella happens in pregnant women is when it is dangerous because it can affect the fetus. Uh, Rosula infantum is another viral fever. Here, usually what happens is the rash appears after the fever has reduced. In measles, we see that uh, rash appears on the second or third day of fever, right? But in Rosula, usually rash appears after the fever stops. In rickettsial infections, also rash appears, but here usually the face is spared. And the dengue is also another common viral fever wherein we see rashes. But uh, again, the, the symptoms of dengue is typical wherein you have fever, retroorbital pain, headache, nausea. So that is what helps us to differentiate. Uh, and then uh, other viral rashes like chickenpox, varicella, uh, erythema infectiosum, or enterovirus, which is a hand, foot, mouth disease. So these are all some of the differential diagnosis. Uh, even bacterial fevers like scarlet fever, mycoplasma infection, all of these can also have rashes. So again, here uh, we have to differentiate because in scarlet fever, there usually will be a uh, throat uh, involvement. So there'll be a pharyngitis, there will be a, a sandpaper-like erythematous rash that we see. In mycoplasma infection, also there will be a respiratory tract infection and uh, there can be a mild uh, rash in this case. Uh, we can have a drug-induced rash as well, but here we will have a history of drug intake, which helps us to differentiate. And uh, we can have a meningococcemia, which can also have a rash. But here the rash is usually petechial. So there will be petechial, not more of a macular papillar sort of a rash. And in a meningococcal infection, we will not have respiratory symptoms. So that is what helps us to differentiate. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, again, is another viral infection. I mean, another tick disease which can result in a rash, but here there will be a history of tick exposure and the rash typically begins in the extremities, whereas in measles we see that it begins with the face. Uh, other differential diagnoses are Kawasaki disease, immunoglobulin A vasculitis, infectious mononucleosis. So all of these things have to be kept in mind whenever we are dealing with a child or a patient with fever, respiratory uh, symptoms, as well as a rash in the body. We have to keep all of these differential diagnoses in mind. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so uh, coming to the treatment, treatment for measles as such, there is no specific treatment, there is no specific antiviral treatment that we can use for treating measles. Measles treatment is mainly supportive. So uh, give paracetamol, antibiotics for the child, fluids, make sure that the child uh, or the patient is well hydrated because dehydration already, also if the patient also starts having diarrhea, then there will be a lot of fluid loss that happens and uh, which is what we will have to be careful about. So fluids is very important and uh, maintenance of hygiene, basically, you know, masking and washing of hands and things like that. And calorie intake. Calorie intake also is very important because measles can result in a significant malnourishment. Already if the child is malnourished, along with that, if the child gets measles, then there will be an increased, uh, the malnutrition nutrition just increases. So we have to maintain uh, adequate fluid and calorie intake. That's very important. Uh, so these are some of the supportive measures that uh, we can use. And of course, for the rash, we can use lotions like a calamine lotion can be used or even simple coconut oil um, can be applied to make the child comfortable. Uh, so these are some of the supportive uh, treatments. Vitamin A is another thing which is very important. So vitamin A, uh, we need to give for uh, children who present with measles. Um, because uh, like I said, you know, sometimes you can have these conjunctival uh, complications like keratitis and uh, corneal ulceration and also vitamin A deficiency also results in these things. So that is why we have to give vitamin A and it's also part of our immunization schedule, right? We give it as part of our immunization schedule. So the dosage for vitamin A is we'll have to give once daily for two days. So for infants less than six months, it's a 50,000 units. For up to 12 months, it is one lakh units. And for children who are up Above 12 months of age, it's a 2 lakh units that we have to give as a stat dose. Uh, we can give continuously for two days. And for those people, for those children who have any signs of vitamin A deficiency, it is better to repeat another stat dose, maybe after four or five weeks of the uh, second dose. Uh, there's also a drug called ribavirin, which is which can be used for measles pneumonia, usually uh, used in babies less than 12 months, or if the even in more than 12 months, if the child is on the ventilator support. Although it's not a very commonly used drug, but this is something that uh, a sort of a newer drug which is being used uh, um, in the treatment of a, of the uh, measles associated pneumonia. So uh, usually we we can use this in immunosuppressed uh, patients. And the dosing is almost 15 to 20 MD, mg per kg per day orally, which is given in two divided doses. Uh, next slide, please. So prevention, I think uh, this is almost the end of the presentation as well. So prevention is the most important aspect of uh, measles control. So measles vaccine, it's very important. Measles vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. It's heat sensitive and it is usually reconstituted before use, stored at 2 to 8 degrees. Uh, given in the subcutaneous route, uh, 0.5 ml over the right upper arm. So previously measles was given as a single vaccine at nine months of age, but now it is given along with the MMR vaccine itself. So MMR vaccine includes measles, mumps and rubella. So uh, MMR vaccine is given at nine months. Uh, why at nine months? Because still nine months, the child will have protection because of the transplacental antibodies that is there. So because of that, uh, there is no, we don't need to give it earlier, but by nine months, the protection sort of comes down. And because children are more susceptible for this disease, we have to immunize them before they are exposed to the vaccine or uh, to the uh, infection. So the first dose is at nine months and then repeated at 15 months. And uh, this is as per the uh, IAP recommendations. And uh, we have to also uh, vaccinate children who are immunocompromised, uh, especially patients with HIV need to be vaccinated because if a child has HIV and gets measles infection, then it can prove to be fatal for that child. So it's important for us to vaccinate the child. Unless uh, the child is having very severe uh, HIV infection, then we will have to first stabilize and then vaccinate. Uh, some of the contraindications for the vaccination include malignancies. Uh, if the child is on therapy with alkylating agents or high dose of steroids, uh, or if the child is being treated in active tuberculosis, then we have to wait uh, till these things are settled and then give the vaccination. Especially if the child is on a high dose of steroid, we have to give a gap of one month uh, before giving the uh, vaccination. 
and uh, for children who are immunocompromised, if they are exposed to the virus, then we can use immunoglobulin as a, a post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, it, irrespective of whether they are vaccinated or not vaccinated, it's better to use immunoglobulin 0.25 to 5 ml per, per kg uh, as a post-exposure prophylaxis. And uh, the other thing is the infection control. So infection control is very similar. I think we all know in infection control now because of COVID. So hand washing, masking, isolation. So these are the important things that we need to do. Isolate the child uh, for four days at least after the appearance of rash. Because once the fourth day is done, then the child uh, or the patient is not infective. So up to four to five days of rash, we can isolate the patient. And uh, uh, because it is a respiratory droplet infection, we have to wear a mask. Uh, when we are treating a child with measles or, you know, when we are around a child with measles or if we are exposed to the infection and regular hand washing technique always helps. So, uh, so uh, I think I, this comes to the end of my presentation.